Um, thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers and the sponsors of this excellent series and all the volunteers um, for, their, for, their, for their service. So today it is indeed a saga I'm going to tell you about. I wouldn't say it's going to be science light, but it is going to talk a lot more about the story around the stellar sea lion. And already I got a question of, are they Stellar's sea lion or are they the Stellar sea lion? Well, I'm using this term because I'm going to talk about the, the guy who, whose name is attached to them. So we're going to go over the next um, while here on a voyage of discovery. And we're going to talk as we go on that voyage about various aspects of the Aleutian Islands and about the stellar sea line as well, and then obviously the work we're, we're, we're participating in. And we'll start with the, uh, the early voyagers, the Aleuts or Onangan. We'll talk about um, the famous second Bering expedition. Briefly mention Captain Cook, because when you talk about these waters, you kind of have to mention Captain Cook. And then about present day uh, sort of research expeditions. And in a true saga, you know, there are highs and lows, there are good guys and bad guys. There's also epic voyages, uh, hopefully always cast against a beautiful, dramatic backdrop. And that's what you're going to see today. So starting with um, the Aleuts, or Onangan people, uh, they have been characterized by many as among the largest and most sophisticated hunter-gatherer communities on Earth. Um, at a time pre-contact, they had some very large communities stretched out uh, along um, the northern uh, Pacific seaboard, specifically uh, the Aleutian Islands. And they were masters um, at uh, ocean-going travel and, and hunting very, very large and sometimes very dangerous animals. Um, they built these highly sophisticated kayaks called badarkas, um, made out of um, stellar sea lion skins. So uh, already we've learned a lot about um, the connection between sea lions and these peoples, the highly waterproof systems, highly waterproof coating, and they used throwing sticks like the atlatl. They had very sophisticated technology um, for taking down very large animals. So um, we fortunately managed to get to work on a project a number of years ago where we and were part of an archaeological study that was looking at the faunal remains in a, in a village that was 3,000 years old, and the ancient village uh, of Onalaska uh, near Amaknak in um, what is near present-day Dutch Harbor. Everybody probably knows Dutch Harbor from Deadliest Catch. Um, and so um, we actually managed to work on uh, some material there in, in, an, in our ancient DNA lab. Um, but a part of the collection that was, de was, was described by these uh, archaeologists included stellar sea lions. So, so we know we have very hard evidence of, of the connection between these people and this magnificent animal. This picture actually here on the left is a beautiful uh, woodcut from uh, Captain Cook's third expedition, uh, eight, uh, 1778, where he was uh, commissioned, obviously, by uh, uh, the British government and the Admiralty to try and find the Northwest Passage. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, so um, at this particular study, um, which is, this is um, a Macnac Bridge site. This is the original um, uh, village site out here. You've got some very large vessels, including some of the crabbers that you see uh, on TV and what have you. Um, and through this study, we, we basically were able to establish that using ancient DNA technologies, even here at Harbor Branch. And they're very powerful tools in reconstructing the past. And we want to re reconstruct the past, not just because we find it fascinating and it's very interesting and it tells us a lot about ourselves, but it also tells us a lot about environments and ecosystems and how they change over time and how things adapt and other things don't adapt, which I think is highly relevant in the context of some of the changes we're seeing today. Um, Moving forward a few thousand years um, to the, uh, the, the Bering Expedition of 1733 to 1741. Um, Vitus Bering was a Danish uh, naval officer who became uh, an explorer. Uh, he worked um, in the um, 
Russian Navy and were commissioned by Peter the Great, uh, who was uh, a czar who was incredibly interested in maritime transport, naval issues, and science. And on this, uh, he commissioned this expedition to learn more about what was at the far eastern part of the then Russian Empire. Um, an earlier expedition, um, again commanded by Bering, uh, with the express purpose of finding out whether Asia was connected to, um, in fact, the Americas. And, of course, he established that that was not the case. Um, and the second expedition uh, had a very interesting kind of objective. And it explains the route they took. Because when you look at the route, if this is the way you want to discover uh, large continents to the east, um, why would you go in this direction? Well. One of the uh, objectives was to see whether there was a land known as Juan de Gama land that had been purported to exist somewhere out in the Pacific. Well, they very quickly realized that it wasn't there, so they turned around and, and stayed on. Their primary objective was to chart more of the lands uh, to, to the east, and in doing so, try and also understand more about the natural history and potential resources that, that Alaska uh, held. The amazing thing about this expedition, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of people here who've, who, who've read about Lewis and Clark and their incredible expedition across the Americas, for these guys to even get started on this expedition, they had to cross, obviously, the, the entire uh, Asian northern continent, uh, twice the distance of Lewis and Clark. It took them several years just to get to Kamchatka and, and the Okhots. And uh, in Kamchatka, uh, they built two ships. Um, the St. Peter and the St. Paul, and they named the town after their two ships, Petro Pavlovsk. And um, they set out on their expedition, and we're going we're to try and follow this through this lecture, and then also follow some of the more recent uh, research um, cruises that, that I've been lucky to be a part of. OK, so on this expedition, there was a young German naturalist, scientist, uh, physician named uh, Georg Steller. And um, this, along, he was uh, accompanied by several other uh, scientists, naturalists. And this sort of, again, underscored the interest that, that uh, the Russians had in, in, in science and scientific exploration. And uh, Steller, likewise, had obviously a very eventful life. And um, I think in the past, I mentioned some of the uh, books that have come out. One excellent book is called Where the Sea Breaks Its Back. And it's kind of about Steller and the Bering Expedition. So if you want to read a little more, that, that's a very interesting book to read. So um, the two ships set off um, south and then east. And somewhere around this region, the two ships got split up, the St. Peter and the St. Paul. And it wasn't until they got all the way to what we now know as Yakutat Bay in, in southeast Alaska, which is another place we're fortunate enough to do some of our research. Uh, they, they, they sighted land. And uh, they sighted a beautiful mountain, which is now called Mount St. Elias. It's one of the largest mountains, the highest mountains in the Americas. And then they started to work their way slowly uh, back along the coast. And Steller only got off the boat on this transit back for 10 hours on one island. Uh, and he just gathered everything he could, described so many things. Um, and as the expedition proceeded, um, scurvy set in, and uh, they, they, they dealt with some storms. Um, and basically, as they got this close to home, they got shipwrecked in true um, ocean maritime fashion back then. Um, and it's really ironic that Bering got shipwrecked on an island called it Bering Island, no, it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, they got shipwrecked on this, on, the, on this island. And this is where they discovered the famous uh, stellar sea cow, amazingly called stellar sea cow. Um, and they subsisted on this large, giant, essentially, manatee of the north for a long time. And uh, Bering passed away. Uh, stellar made it back um, to Kamchatka, stayed there a few, a few years, uh, still working on, on the science of the expedition. And sadly, um, he also passed away. Um, but along the way, he, he made several uh, very, very exciting discoveries. 
um, many of which are familiar to people who have either lived on the West Coast or certainly lived in, in Alaska. Um, Stellar's J, Stellar's Sea Eagle, which is still extant in, in parts of Russia. The Stellar's Eider, this lives, uh, breeds in northern Alaska. It actually is an endangered species. The Stellar Sea Lion, uh, uh, some populations are listed as endangered. And of course, the, the, the infamous Stellar Sea Cow, of which we're also doing some research on, but that's, that's a story for another day. So then there's the famous stellar sea ape. Has anybody heard of stellar sea ape? So this is a, a subject of much debate because he described it in great detail and yet no one has ever seen it since. And as stellar was such an exemplary naturalist uh, and such a great scientist, people were like, well, you know, if he said he saw this and he described it this way, surely it exists. So cryptozoologists are having a field day uh, right up to the present day of trying to figure out what was it? Did it exist? What have you? But interestingly, the Latin name for uh, Stellar's sea ape is, is essentially translated to Stellar's Danish sea ape. And uh, Bering had very long whiskers. And it, it is purported that they didn't get on towards the end of the expedition. <laughs> so maybe, maybe Stellar was just having a little fun here. Um, but who wouldn't want to find that animal? That's pretty cool. So on to uh, the sea lion that he described. Um, it is the largest eared seal, or what we call otoriad in the world. Um, males can get up to a massive you know, 2,500 pounds or so. There's extreme sexual dimorphism with males, adult males being a lot larger than females. Their breeding system is uh, polygynous, um, where uh, males compete um, to mate with um, multiple females. So how they do this is um, what we call um, mate resource polygyny, where, where they're trying to defend a resource rather than monopolize females. So what they do is they set up these territories uh, on these remote islands termed rookeries, and they compete for females. So we'll, we'll learn a little more about this as we go along. And the females uh, haul out on these rookeries to give birth to their pup uh, from the previous year's mating season. Uh, in early summer. They range across a vast area swath of the North Pacific. Um, and the Aleutian Islands, which is what we're going to focus on primarily today, um, was the center of, the, of, of their, or a stronghold of their range. Currently, three different stocks have been identified or management units, um, the Eastern, Western, and Asian, and you'll hear those names pop up um, over time. So here's a quick uh, sort of map of their overall range and all these little Triangles here are the known rookeries of these sea lions, where they come in the summer, year after year, they haul out and they breed, um, and what have you. So where it gets interesting for us as, as, as conservation biologists and research scientists is um, the plight of the stellar sea lions in more recent years has been very dramatic. The numbers crashed from the 70s to the 90s throughout much of the range. Um, you can see here the western stock. I mentioned there's two stocks at present in Alaska. There's this eastern, western, and now there's this Asian stock with a lion sort of in this region here. And the primary crash occurred um, in, this, in this western area. And two stocks, there's this distributional break. That's how they define the stocks. There was just a gap in distribution, and the trends were very different. Uh, the western stock got listed as endangered, and that's very interesting because when something gets listed as endangered, a lot of things trigger, um, or a lot of things are triggered once that listing occurs. One of which is defining what they call critical habitat for the recovery of that species. And so critical habitat gets defined under the Endangered Species Act. And that can obviously influence human activities in that critical habitat. So that often becomes a battleground for um, various stakeholders as to, well, you know, what should we be protecting and what are the activities we should be limiting. And, and this goes for a lot of activities, um, whether it's oil and gas, or whether it's fisheries, or whether it's tourism, or shipping, or whatever. The, the, the big issue is, um, where's the critical habitat? So they defined critical habitat around these breeding rookeries. And that they essentially became sort of fishery exclusion zones. So with that level of impact on potential you know, commercial interests, that fomented a huge um, urgency to try and find out what the problem is and try and recover 
these animals and, and remove, shall we say, some of those restrictions. So there's been a massive research effort for the last several decades in trying to understand uh, and turn around the fate of, of these um, populations. So um, this is where we kind of come into the story. We started to look at genetic markers to try and understand a little more about the um, uh, breeding and dispersal behavior uh, and movements of these sea lions, um, not so much by tagging them, but by getting samples from them and trying to understand uh, a lot more. And what we found was what others had before us, we were able to confirm that there was a very strong genetic break pretty much where they had drawn the line. So, so that, that, that was sort of nailed. This is a little family tree of different mitochondrial lineages or genetic lineages. And what you see from that tree is all the eastern animals in, in, in blue are kind of on one end of the tree and all the, all the western animals in red are on this other side of the tree. So, that, so we have these very, very distinct metapopulations. Um, However, we kept looking, and I suppose that's, that's, that's the lesson here. You sometimes have to, you don't stop, you want to keep looking. And we've, we, did, we discovered a second break um, within the Western stock, uh, and that was quite a surprise. Um, when we came back to our colleagues, they're like, whoa. Um, and so then we tried to understand, well, why is there a break in this region here between um, sort of the Gulf and the Eastern Aleutians and then the Central and Western Aleutians around a place called Somalda Pass? So one of the things that's interesting about it, we started to see if this break lined up with anything else of relevance or of interest or, or of importance to sea lions. And sure enough, what we found is that um, at the same time, people were studying, uh, were, were, were looking at trends in abundance. And even though the overall population had declined, by about the 2000s, some areas were starting to recover but other areas were going in the opposite direction, particularly the Western Aleutians. So this genetic break seemed to jive with very different sort of trajectories for, for these sort of possible subpopulations. There was also very, diff very different diets that these sea lions were eating in, the, in these sort of two now subregions within the Western stock. And also, and when we looked at things from a sort of environmental or oceanographic perspective, there's a very clear divergence between what we would call uh, continental shelf waters and uh, rookeries in that area and, and ocean basin waters. And, and there's been subsequent sort of divergences between those two. So all these different things are lining up to where there's a break in this western stock and secondly, things may be pretty, pretty bad out west. And you know, they're sort of living in their own misery. They're not part of this bigger stock that may be doing better. They're kind of, you know, you're on your own, guys. So, so that now has focused a lot of attention in the Western Aleutians. So here's where we pick up our story. How do we solve this mystery? Um, what happened in the Western Aleutians, or what is happening to these sea lions way out west? Well, there's a lot of challenges to answering that question. Uh, one is getting there, especially from Florida. Um, <laughs> But what's really cool about it is I can honestly say I go from one end of this country all the way to the other end of this country, 6,000 miles. Um, and so getting there, um, they're among the most remote islands in the world. Uh, working there, <laughs> they are currently um, uninhabited. They weren't always that way, and there's a story I've got to relate about that. Um, very rugged, sheer cliffs, treeless. Um, if Oliver Cromwell, I, I guess, had visited the Aleutians, he might have been heard to say the very same thing he said when he went to the west of Ireland, uh, which was, there's not enough water to drown a man, not enough trees to hang a man, or not enough soil to bury a man. <laughs> um, so, um, very wild, rugged area, um, plenty of water, granted. Um, extreme weather, um, short field season, and yes, big animals with big teeth, and, and we certainly uh, start talking a little about them here shortly. So um, some other aspects about it. It's, it's literally the most spectacular island archipelago you can imagine. Uh, volcanic um, islands rising up out of the ocean. Um, this is a great example of the island of the four mountains, each one a perfect volcano. Uh, stunning vistas, uh, and also surrounded by incredibly productive oceans. So they are this bleak, potentially, you know, stark um, 
series of islands surrounded by a really uh, dynamic and very productive ocean, partly because it's at the border between very shallow Bering Sea shelf waters, right, and these very deep ocean waters pushing all these nutrients up onto the shelf into the floating zone, and then you just trigger off this huge explosion of life on a seasonal basis, particularly. And um, actually, what's really interesting, they've done some studies on these islands where they're like, well, where's all the nutrients coming from? And a lot of the nutrients is coming from the ocean to the land, um, carried conveniently by seabirds um, who, who are breeding on these islands. Uh, uh, and so there's this net transport from, from ocean to land, creating relatively fertile areas on this, these volcanic uh, islands. So um, I think I just said all this, by the way. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a really dynamic place. Um, and it is one of the largest uh, maritime refuges in the world. Uh, interestingly, um, because we're so far out on the Aleutians, we can see Russia. Um, <laughs> because we're so far out on the Aleutians, um, our neighbors here are, 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 are the Russians, and they're studying sea lions too. Remember, now they continue all the way down to the Kuril Islands in Japan. And in fact, the Western Aleutians may be more connected to, to the Commander Islands or, or, or the, the nearest Russian islands than, for example, they might be to others in an ecological sense from the point of view of the stellar sea lion. So really, if we're going to study these guys, we need to be studying these guys. Unfortunately, that's what's happening here. Um, this is a lovely uh, picture here. This is Stellar's Arch near South Rookery on Bering Island. So um, this is where the, the last stand of that expedition was, and it's the Stellar Sea Line Rookery. Uh, another interesting aspect about the Aleutians you may not all be aware of, parts of the Aleutians were occupied by the Japanese during the war. And um, it's really intriguing to kind of sail these islands um, and that led to a compulsory evacuation of Aleuts uh, uh, from that part of the, the, um, the Aleutian Islands, of which many have not been repatriated. They're still uninhabited. And that obviously is, a, is quite a contentious and emotional uh, issue. So we have some suspects to our crime or to our mystery here. Um, but it's a long list. And this is what we're working our way through. Um, the leading contender for many years was um, nutritional stress. The idea here was that sea lions in the Western Aleutians um, were not getting enough nutritious food. And that could have been for two primary reasons. There were these major ecosystem uh, shifts in the 70s. Uh, and maybe um, this altered the prey base to where they weren't eating enough nutritious food. Or they're being outcompeted by uh, more and more efficient and more and more successful fisheries, or some combination of the two. That debate has kind of raged for about two decades now. Uh, it's sometimes called the junk food hypothesis. They're eating a lot of food, but it's not very good for them, uh, and what have you. And, and nutritional issues are probably involved. A new uh, suspect uh, is certainly emerging, and that is um, contaminants. Um, possibly through natural forcing events uh, at very high levels uh, in the food chain. I'm talking about mercury here. There's a big study going on looking at mercury in, in, in the hair of sea lions, just like a lot of the studies here looking at mercury um, in, in human and dolphin populations. So um, this is a map of um, a mercury out in Agatu Island in the far western Aleutians uh, done by uh, Lori Ria and colleagues. Another one might be mass emigration. This often happens islands. Um, another one could be there may be uh, predation. There could be some disease issues. Disease has generally been discounted. And then we kind of get into the areas I'm very interested in is could there be some intrinsic issues with these sea lines at a genetic or even at an epigenetic level? Um, and then obviously shifting baselines theory is just when you figured it out, now climate change comes along and it's sort of, it, it's kind of changing everything. It's moving the goalposts. So a lot, a lot of potential suspects. And this brings us right up to just this summer where um, a team of scientists uh, you know, went on an expedition to the Western Aleutian Islands specifically. Um, and we were very fortunate to be part of that. 
It was led by the National Marine Fishery Service uh, at NOAA. Uh, it contained scientists from the Alaska Pirate Fish and Game. The, the ship, uh, the vessel, the RV Tekla, which is Aleut for Eagle, um, um, was, was, was our ship. Um, the University of Alaska and other agencies, and obviously ourselves, um, managed to, to go on this epic trip way out west. So here we get to some actual field notes. Even though um, I may be characterized as a geneticist, behavioral scientist, I'm really a natural historian. I just like going out in the field and filling things into my uh, um, uh, field notes, my daily field notes. And um, so we start out from Atka Island, and we move all the way out west, all the way past Agatu to Atu, and way beyond um, this little line here in blue is, is actually uh, the 180-degree uh, meridian. So like I said, we've gone so far west, we actually have gone east. So we've gone halfway around the world. So now we're on uh, officially um, eastern longitude. Um, those are a, near, a series of the, the first islands we visited in, in, in the first few days. So one of the first things we had to do um, when you go on these trips, right, there's multiple projects going on and you just pitch in and you, you, you know, you, you, you contribute, was um, they have started a, an excellent study right across the range where they have built these special cameras. They've managed to position them on these incredibly precarious perches and those cameras are left there all year to essentially monitor what's going on on these rookeries or these breeding sites or hauling sites. So yeah, when you're told day one, this is where we're going. The top of some of these spires are half the size of this lectern. So you're kind of going up this little thing to, to put up these cameras. But this is Alexi and Tom and managing to um, work our way from one island to the next to kind of maintain these cameras and download vast amounts of photographs, which are telling them a lot about sea lion behavior and movements and what have you. So, but it's well worth the effort. Um, I like this picture because you get to see sort of the interior of some of these islands, no trees, but very lush grasses and some beautiful flowers as well. And you get up to these really, really huge um, heights and you get to look down and, you know, um, sea lions, you know, they pick really nice real estate. <laughs> I mean, they, they like an ocean view. Um, and over here you can see our little ship and there's some, some people here uh, doing some other work which I'll show you shortly. And when you get to these areas, you think no one's been here for a very long time, nothing else is going on. And then you look down and you realize, whoa, wait a second, hold on. And uh, These are some various mammal bones or some bird bones. There's some flint napping. And you realize, my God, you know, we're actually at an ancient, who knows how old, uh, Unangan or Aleut site, possibly a hunting lookout. And, um, you know, that was just a really exhilarating thing for me because you had this idea or they had this idea, you know, this would be a great place to observe sea lions and put a camera. And then you look down and go, well, you know, we're not the first to come up with that idea. Uh, and, of course, with our interest in archaeology and anthropology, I, I, I just thought, you know, this is a whole new side to this question and we could potentially be mining these middens for old bones and reconstructing some very detailed history. And so... It was well worth the climb up and well worth the climb down. Okay. Um, this is what we found in many sites we would go to. We'd be observing things and then we'd be kind of looking around going, wait a second, hold on. Um, and some of the places we found were there were these depressions in the ground. And these depressions were the remnants of these um, partially subterranean Aleut dwellings. So the, the Aleut very cleverly would build these, they're called barabaras, where part of the structure was underground and then there would be a roof on top um, with, made from driftwood, no trees, right, and, and covered in sod. And um, while you're sitting watching some sea lines or something, you find you're in a dip and then there's another dip and another depression. And we found some petroglyphs and what have you. So here we are kind of maintaining one of these cameras. Um, Another study that was going on was trying to be more efficient and, and be less disruptive to sea lion rookeries, and that is simply trying to find the best way to go out and count uh, sea lions, measure sea lions. We can learn a lot from aerial photographs of the size of a sea lion, its body condition, 
we can understand a lot about the ratio of pups to juveniles to males to females. And we can even understand a lot about behavior depending on how they're, they, they organize themselves out on a rock. You could, there's an awful lot you can learn from an aerial photograph. So they used to have to fly these um, uh, twin otter planes um, all the way out there, station them at various islands, station a lot of fuel. And now, of course, what they're doing is they're flying these drones with uh, incredib incredible results. So that was another project that was going on at the same time. And that's the kind of technology that I'm trying to incorporate into, into my research, too. So here's just a few more shots of, of the kind of detailed information you can get from, from some of these photos. Um, so here's a bull, uh, probably a number of females here, a couple of little pups. So you could potentially map territories and who are the dominant bulls, who are the subordinate bulls. And we had to lower and, uh, and bring stuff up and down from these, these, these high cliffs. There's some people over here flying a drone. There's some people down here re retrieving um, uh, some equipment and obviously some lupins. So as we continue our trip, and uh, I'll get to what we were also, we're, there was other things we were doing at those rookeries, but I'll just give it to you in this format. We, we basically um, continued through the, the, the the um, Western Aleutians are here, and now we're getting into the Central Aleutians, stopping at a number of rookeries, Ulak, I'll talk about Ulak in a minute. And we were starting to look for some other animals where there are other species. So um, let's get to the meat of what we're trying to do here. Um, studying marine mammals, you have to be very careful what you choose. So if there's any young people in the audience here who are thinking about marine mammals, there's a trade-off you make. You know, The bigger, the wilder, the sexier the animal is, Maybe the less accessible they are, right? you know. There's a lot of you know. Whereas with with sea lions, with pinnipeds, they very conveniently come out on land for a few weeks a year, do all this really interesting behavior. They produce very sort of manageable sized offspring that you know scientists can come along later and pick up. So we were able to focus a lot of our work on catching pups, and these pups, the way they, the way we would catch them simply is. There's a lot of activity going on on the rookery. The males are defending territories. You try and ease off the males, and then all the little pups stay in these little creches and kind of huddle together. And so they got very good at kind of herding these pups into these little groups. And then we would kind of go in and just catch a pup, put it in a little net, and, and collect a lot of uh, data on them. So here's a rookery, for example. Uh, and you know, half the time you can't stop. And you, have, you find yourself stopping just to look around. I mean, place is so spectacular. Um, we had eagles and peregrine falcons on the top of this, this, this stack here. You know, sea lions, um, I think you can sort of see them. They're kind of here and in the back. And here we are setting up a little tripod to weigh animals and what have you. So it, it works very efficiently. Um, study number three, yes. So, so here we are. We have a little uh, wooden platform, and a, we built a little nose cone, and we put the little pup's head in there, and then we have, we have vets who, 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 you know, and give them a little sleeping gas for a while, and then we do all our work, and then they wake up, and then we make sure they're fine, and we release them back to the, to, to the crash. So we worked our way through about 300 pups um, this way um, through several rookeries. And uh, in our collection, Tatiana will tell you, I think we might have 3,000, 4,000 uh, samples from pups all over the, the place. So it's, it's a big project. Um, we continued uh, through several other um, amazing um, uh, landscapes, um, Kansatoshi um, volcanoes, particularly spectacular. Some are snow covered, um, uh, a myriad of wildlife, including birds, whales, what have you. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little about the males. So we said the young are cute, but they bite, but the, the males, you know, they really bite. And now they're annoyed because. Here they are, preening themselves, trying to protect their territories, trying to impress the ladies. And then we come along. And it's very interesting. They really are reluctant to move, to potentially lose their, their place in the sun, their prime real estate. Um, and so um, it was really fascinating to start to video and, and record and try and understand more about the mating systems of these giant, giant males. And I mean, they really rip into each other. I mean, some are just covered in blood. Um, 
they have testosterone literally coming out their eyes. They're, 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 they are, they're, they're, um, they've bulked up. Um, they have, they're not eating, you know. It's kind of like, um, I don't know. Uh, oh, good. Here, here's an example. As I said, it's all fun and game until somebody loses an eye. So up to now, it's all been very nice. But, you know, here's where nature is really red in, in, in tooth and claw. So let me see. So this guy here, he's, he's, he's obviously very dominant. He's pushing this guy off. These guys aren't so lucky, but they're constantly waiting for their moment. This guy is also quite a dominant male. And uh, what's really interesting, there's, there's no loyalty among these males. If one male attacks one, another one will go in and bite him quickly as well. <laughs> you know? And so look at these little guys. These little pups here are like, they're constantly terrified that while they're fighting, these little, these little M&Ms you know, are going to get squished. Um, but they always seem to manage to get out of everything. Look at these two guys go out there and start worrying to grab onto that mane. Um, so it's, it's pretty kind of chaotic and pretty epic stuff. Yeah, so you can see sort of here, these are these juveniles or, or younger or subordinate or maybe older males who have lost their place, constantly triangulating. You know, it's like singles bar on Saturday Night in Bureau, you know. <laughs> Come to this table. Um, high risk, high reward. You know, um, you'll see them sometimes just completely, you know, passed out nearly, you know, three tons of an animal just and sleeping it off. And even when chaos is going on around them, they're just out for the count. So um, it may be high risk, high reward, but as we all know, it's ultimately female choice. So this is the thing I'm most interested in. Um, in, re in resource defense polygyny, right? So sea lion bulls, they establish and defend these territories. Um, and the females likely select males based on their success at defending prime real estate. That sounds like he's a pretty fit guy, you know, big house on the hill. Um, but also running off others, you know. Uh, and one advantage of that is the female is focused on raising the pups. She doesn't want to be harassed constantly, all the time. So if there's a big bad guy who's keeping everybody away, she's like, okay, you know, that's, that's, that's doubly good for me. Um, so that's what we see. But if we could get samples, there's a lot more interesting things we think might be going on there. One is, is there mate fidelity from one year to the next? Um, you know, is there rookery fidelity? Do, do, do the same sea lions come back to the same rookery year after year? Do, their, do, you know, do they come back to the rookery they were born on? Um, you know, is there territory fidelity in males and pupping site fidelity in females? So is, is a male able to keep the same territory and the same patch of ground year after year? Um, a very important point, um, is all this huff and puff and you know, bravado, is that really paying off? Are, are these big guys, in fact, uh, siring all the offspring? And there truly is a tall, dark stranger effect in a lot of, in a, in a lot of uh, species to where the alternative male may, may seem more attractive. So we wanted to look at some of these questions. We have the power to do so because we're collecting samples. But we had to do it in a very kind of um, unusual way. All we had was the pups, right? So you know, you're not going to walk out there and try and sample a few guys, say, hold on, everybody, I just want to take a little sample. So we have the pups, but one of the things we found with the pups is we could determine which pups were related. So if you found two what we call full sibs, you could say, OK, they've got the same mom and the same dad. And if they were on two different rookeries in two different years, you're like, it looks like they uprooted and they went here. But most of the time, we would find half sibs. But we could also figure out if they had the same mom or if they had the same dad. And that allowed us to figure out a lot about the movements of males and females. And, and so we, we were able to show, for example, that um, in a lot of times, we would find uh, half sibs you know, that were on uh, different rookeries, but in different years. But sometimes you would find pups that were, you, you knew that the mom had moved or the dad had moved. And so we were able to draw these lines between rookeries where nobody else, none of the other science research projects were figuring out that there were these there was this movement and gene flow going on. And we did this through this kind of kinship analysis. We did, however, find that there was very minimal evidence of mate fidelity. So 
it seems that what a female does is each year she decides probably to come back to the same area, but who it is she's going to mate with. So, so, so there's a strategy there um, um, that, that, that seems to be adaptive uh, for these females. And then you're told, wait, now hold on, there's bigger animals with bigger teeth than what we've been just studying. Uh, and, and the great thing about this project is because it's so difficult to get there and so expensive, we actually were able to have people come who were looking at other, other species. Uh, and one of those species was the killer whale. And this was a, a really incredible study um, because um, here you're probably looking at you know, the daddy of them all in terms of the top predator in the entire ecosystem. So there's, there's an interest there to understand what the role is in that ecosystem and particularly, are they in some way involved in this mystery that we're trying to solve? Okay, so um, we kind of got our answer uh, pretty early on when we were studying um, a rookery uh, on Ulak Island, and these killer whales moved in. Now, I should say with killer whales, there's a number of different ecotypes around the world, but in this region, uh, for the sake of simplicity, there's, there's two strategies or two types of, of killer whale. There's the fish eaters, which they are known as residents, and then there's the transients, or the mammal eaters. So these were clearly transients and killer whales coming in, one large bull uh, and a subadult. And we documented or we saw a lot, shall we say, of, of predation attempts. Um, and uh, the issue then on the bigger scale is if they're predators of sea lions and they're the ultimate top-down force on an ecosystem, might they in some way be responsible for some of these declines or what may be more likely is they may not be responsible for it, but they're such efficient predators that they're preventing those populations from recovering. It's sometimes called a predator pit, right, where it doesn't matter if there's 10 gazelles left or 1,000 gazelles left, cheetah's still a very good hunter. So you know, it's, it's going to get those gazelles kind of thing. So um, there's a lot of debate about this issue right now. Um, and ultimately, there's just a general interest in trying to understand more about killer whales um, in this area. Now, I should say, um, one of the things that really blew me away about these few days watching these killer whales is, okay, it's already amazing that you're working on stellar sea lions in this incredibly wild area. And now you've got these killer whales coming in, hunting sea lions. And your job is to determine whether we need a Phillips screwdriver or a flathead to, ter to, to screw in the casing on a camera. So you've got this combination between the extraordinary and the incredibly ordinary. And you're like, yeah, yeah, did, did anybody get a photo of that? Yeah, oh, God. You know, you've got to get your work done, right? You've got you to keep doing what you're, what you're supposed to be doing when you really just want to watch What's, an, what's a spectacular event going on. So I, I kind of thought that, to me, was, was pretty amazing. Um, and finally, you know, one of the things that, that has really struck me about doing this research uh, on, on these species is I hope I've given you an idea that, about how dynamic the system is, right? Things are changing all the time, um, how, how productive at times and then how destructive at times. Um, but even the islands are changing, right? So, so um, there are volcanoes erupting all the time. And while we were there, Bogoslav volcano uh, was erupting. Uh, and uh, there's a nice connection here um, between, um, uh, well, it's a tenuous one. Um, but uh, as we know, Teddy Roosevelt defined the first wildlife refuge in 1903 in Pelican Island, and I was, I was really impressed to read in, in a little plaque that he had also um, um, protected Bogoslav uh, as a wildlife refuge in 1909, specifically for nesting birds and sea lions. And what was incredible about this was, while the eruptions are going off, there's birds swirling around trying to nest, there's sea lions hauling out, there's fur seals in huge numbers hauling out. And so life kind of goes on, you know, in, in these areas. And just to show you how dramatic the, the most recent eruption has been, um, this was the entire island in, in 2015, right? And these were the beaches where the sea lions would have hauled out and the fur seals and, and these cliffs would be where the seabirds 
with an S group. This was it last March, right? So, I mean, you know, it's completely, completely altered. And I think the expectation was, you know, your sea lion going home for the holidays, and they're like, what? <laughs> and, you know, turn around and go. They're, you know, it's very much like, oh, okay, I guess, you know. And so I thought that was pretty uh, spectacular. So now I'm just going to end with a couple of videos and, and maybe talk you guys through it. Um, that's not a very flattering picture. So um, here we are doing some of the killer whale sightings. This guy here has a tag on the end of a crossbow, right there, a very small tag. And out here we have a group of resident killer whales and the fish eaters. And so this team, um, Paul Wade and colleagues, um, were hoping to tag them. This was an amazing encounter. One day we were in a very tiny little boat. I mentioned a very tiny little boat. And uh, we had some input. Um, that's, our, that's, that's the whole of our boat there. And there's a bigger animal, I think, at the back. Of the uh, Tatiana was telling me it looks like an aquarium with how clear that water is. And then this is this is Bogoslav Island, uh, just kind of to round it off. Um, I think I have a few more pictures of just kind of epic epic scenery here. Um, again, with some killer whales. It wasn't all fun and games. Um, we got we definitely got some Aleutian weather. These are some dolls porpoise um, bow riding our ship. Um, so um, we saw some beaked whales, some very rare species of whales, and incredible numbers of birds. Uh, at one point we saw possibly 60 humpback whales, numbers that we haven't heard of in many ways since pre-whaling, and, and that was just an epic day. Um, so, um, kind of mesmerizing. Uh, here we are. Uh, on one of the rookeries, um, little pups here, little chocolate brown pups, and we're trying to herd them. This one just decided to fall asleep. And yes, so we're not finished. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and there's a big bull right there who's not too happy. So, um, future plans. Um, one of the things we're very excited about is moving more and more into this field of epigenetics where we're trying to look and see whether there are long-term effects of stress or stressors on particular individuals and even on subsequent generations. Um, and those effects could occur in, in, in modifications to the DNA itself. And this is obviously a burgeoning field in, in, in human medicine and human science. And we're trying to apply a lot of those techniques to studying populations that for some reason or other are not recovering when we think they should be recovering. That there may be these legacy effects or these lag effects. And so uh, our effort right now is to try and get funding to look at these sort of epigenetic uh, aspects. And I hope to be able to come back to you um, sometime shortly and tell you about that. In the interim, what we're really trying to do is also return uh, to the Western Revolutions and in fact uh, take an expedition to the Commander Islands in Russia. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, that's the place that's definitely connected to that part of the world. And so there will be a lot of challenges in trying to do that, but I think uh, it's a very um, important thing that we try. And uh, I think we have some very good colleagues trying to help us. And in many ways, it, it brings us to uh, full circle. Uh, this is the statue of, of, of Vitus Bering. Uh, on Bering Island. This is Med Medney Island where the sea lions are. and This is a, a bigger picture of Medney. So the hope is that we can, we can go, go there. We can pay homage to the great man himself. And uh, we can continue to do this research. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>